Namo Buddhaya, this is Abhinav Gulecha and I welcome you. In this video, I am uh, discussing my learnings from Middle Discourses 101. This is at Devdaha, known as Devdaha Sutta. And uh, <coughs> uh, the link to the discourse is given in the description. This is a bit complicated discourse, but it is a very, very important discourse. So I'll try my best in this video to summarize my learnings. But I also ask you to please do the reading at your end. And you will get your own insights. So basically what happens here is that Buddha was stay, staying in the Sakyan town of Devadaha. And now Buddha said to the mendicants about the Jain ascetics. See Buddha was practicing teaching at the time of the Jain ascetic Mahavira. Right? So uh, and Buddha had openly refuted the Jain doctrine of uh, extreme asceticism. asceticism. That means that means extreme self mortification, uh, giving pain to the body, right? So in this discourse, he has amply again refuted the Jain doctrine, and he has like of given a lot of logics why he is refuting the Jain doctrine and what is the right way of uh, striving. So the way Jains strive uh, by giving pain to the body, Buddha said this is wrong. The right way of the striving that Buddha is telling. So it's a important discourse. Uh, listen it with an open mind and uh, because there are certain great logic that Buddha is giving, the arguments that Buddha is giving against this. Because Buddha had, during his time of enlightenment, during his six years, he had done all those practices. And then he realized that this is there is no good that comes out, do, you know, giving pain to your body, right? So you should have a middle way. And that's why the Noble Eightfold Path is a middle path, not indulging too much in sensual pleasures and not... Uh, giving too much extreme pain, right? Which even lay, lay people like you and me, we can follow, right? So let's come to the discourse. So Buddha says, mendicants, there are some ascetics and Brahmins who have this doctrine in view. Everything this individual experiences, pleasurable, painful, neutral, is because of past de deeds. So due to eliminating past deeds by fervent mortification, that means with giving pain to the body and not doing any new deeds, there is nothing to come up in the future. So what Jains believe is that uh, uh, or or what was the kind of a doctrine that that prevalent at that time was that you the all the pleasure and pain that you have is because of past deeds and you, what you have to do is you have to give extreme pain to your body to clear out those karmas and don't create new karmas by way of uh, you know uh, wrong body wrong speech wrong bodily actions or wrong thoughts do not create new actions right so when with no future consequence, deeds end. With the ending of deeds, suffering ends. With the ending of suffering, feeling ends. And with the ending of feeling, all suffering will have to be will have been worn away. So this was the path of the Jains, the Jain doctrine, such as the doctrine of the Jain ascetics. Then Buddha says that I went up to the Jain ascetics who say this, and I said, "Is this is it really true that this is the venerable's view?" <coughs> they admitted that yes, it is. Then Buddha said, now Buddha asked some pointed questions at them, those Jain ascetics. Do you know for sure that you existed in the past and it is not the case that you did not exist? No, we don't know. They said, well, we don't know whether we existed in the past or not. But second, Buddha said, do you know for sure that you did bad deeds in the past? So you, in Jain, Jain uh, uh, doctrine, you take the presumption that you did the wrong acts and it's like you you have these bad deeds and you have to do all these practices to remove the... So, so Buddha's pointed question to them was, did you do bad deeds in the past? They said, no, we don't know. Then, they, then, then Buddha asked, do you know that you did such and such bad deeds? They said, no, we don't have an idea to that. Then Buddha said, but reverence, do you know that so much such suffering has been worn away? Or so much so suffering still remains. That means out of the total suffering, how much percentage has gone or how much percentage remains. They say, no, we don't know. Then Buddha asks, do you know about giving unskillful qualities in the present life and embracing skillful qualities? They said, we don't know. Because they have been taught only to give pain to their body so that the karma will go. The karma will get clear. They do not know about any skillful qualities and all those things. So then Buddha said, it seems that you don't know any of these things. In that case, it is not appropriate for the Jain venerables to declare this. Whatever they have declared, that the whole thing, the para that I said in the start, Buddha said, since you don't know these things, you should not say that doctrine. Uh, now, supposing you did know these things, in that case, you would be appropriate. Now, there was this 
analogy of an arrow that Buddha says that something a man was stuck by an arrow, th thickly smeared with poison, causing painful sharp, painful feelings. Their the friends and colleagues would get a field server, surgeon to trip, treat them, and and the, the surgeon will do the everything process, and the wound will get healed. They would think earlier I was struck struck by an arrow thickly smeared with poison. My friends relatives got the field surgeon to treat me. And now wound is getting healed. Wound has got completely healed. Then you can say, so Buddha was trying to say, if you would be knowing whether you existed in the past, whether you did bad deeds, if you would have got clarity on that, then you could prescribe your doctorate. But since you don't know that, then how can you prescribe that doctorate? But the difference in Buddha's teaching was that Buddha was a fully realized one. He knew through his enlightenment, on the night of his enlightenment, he got these knowledges that, of the, the three knowledges that he got. So Buddha said, Unless and until you are a fully realized one, then, then you can claim a particular thing to be a particular truth. Okay, then I'm just re reading the main main things, otherwise it's a long discourse. Okay, then Buddha asked the genesitics, at the time of intense exertion and striving, do you, do you suffer painful, sharp, severe, acute feelings due to overexertion? Whereas at a time without inter intense exertion, do you not suffer? So they said at the time of intense exertion, we suffer painful sharp feelings. So Buddha said, okay, only at the time of exertion you suffer, no? So Buddha basically tried to uh, share this point that it's not appropriate for the Jain Venerables to declare that everything an individual experience, pleasure, pain, painful, neutral is because of past deeds. Because you yourself have proved that when you do the exertion, then you feel the pain. When you don't do the exertion, then you don't feel the pain. Right? So, th that again thing Buddha refuted. Okay. Then Buddha says, uh, if a deed has to be experienced in this life, can exertion make it be... Exp okay. Buddha says, if a deed, particular deed, the consequence of that deed, because in Jain uh, doctrine also there is this theory of karma, law of karma. So, if the consequence of a particular deed has to be experienced in this life, can the exertion that you are doing will ensure that it will not be experienced in this life? They said, no, I, we don't know. So, if the uh, deed has to be experienced in this life, can exertion make it experienced in lives to come? They don't, they say, no. If the deed has to be experienced in lives to come, can the exertion make it experienced in this life? No. If the deed is to be experienced as a pleasure, can the exertion make it experienced as pain? No. So basically, Buddha says, asks a lot of questions and then Buddha says, exertion, basically to prove that exertion, you cannot correlate the effort that you are putting in your exertion to experiencing whether pain or pleasure. So exertion cannot change the way deeds are experienced in any of the ways. That means, you exert effort or not, that is the pain or pleasure that you experience because of the deeds is not correlated with the ex exertion that you do at all, right? Okay. Then Buddha again says one more logic is that if sentient beings experience pleasure and pain because of past deeds, clearly the Jains have done ba bad deeds in the past, right? Because they, they go with that notion. If then if sentient beings, Buddha is lay, saying four or five kind of uh, 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 grounds, right? Of So first is if bad deeds are done, then they... If it's because of the bad deeds, then Jains may have done bad deeds in the past. If sentient beings experience pleasure and pain because of God Almighty's creation, clearly the Jains were created by a bad God, right? Buddha is basically giving that if you hold that doctrine, then that will be the consequence answer, right? Then if sentient beings experience pleasure and pain because of circumstances, now circumstances is basically the deterministic uh, kind of doctrine where there is this fatalism, determinism that everything is predestined. Then basically they will, Jains will arise from bad circumstances. If sentient beings experience pleasure and pain because of the class of rebirth, then Jains have reborn in, in bad class. Which is, fifth is, if sentient beings experience pleasure and pain because of exertion, clearly the Jains exert themselves badly in the present since they now have experienced such an intense pain. So basically, Buddha is saying, trying to say is that if you hold that notion of what they are holding that doctrine, then it is basically either they have been, uh, 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 they they were created by a bad god, 
or they have done bad deeds in the past or they have go, born in a bad class at birth right all those things those will be the conclusions so uh, buddha says the jain deserve criticism whether or not sentient beings experience pleasure and pain right because buddha says that their doctrine is wrong the jain ascetics who say this this is the doc their doctrine is deserve rebuke and criticism on the 10 legitimate grounds that's how exertion and striving is fruitless so buddha is saying that the exertion and striving that jains do is fruitless now please don't get it wrong uh, no i respect all religions i myself am a jain right i myself am a jain but i practice buddha's teachings so it's not i'm just saying what is given in the discourse buddha wherever buddha says saw something wrong he he made it a point to say they even criticize the hindu caste system and the uh, animal sacrifices and lot of the, he rejected the vedas completely right because where he saw something is wrong he would point that right now it is upon the other person to accept his point or view or not that is a different thing right okay then uh, comes that now buddha is coming upon how is exertion and striving fruitful now remember buddha's teaching the noble eightfold path one of the paths was right effort making the right effort that means the right exertion so here buddha is giving guidelines on that so buddha says it's when a mendicant doesn't bring suffering upon themselves and do not give up legitimate pleasure but they are not besotted with that pleasure that means they don't bring suffering upon themselves they don't give up legitimate pleasure that means it's not that i will not have any pleasure but don't be besotted don't do too, don't do into too much the pleasure they understand when i actively strive i become dispassionate towards the source of suffering but when i develop equanimity i become dispassionate towards this other source of suffering so they actively strive or develop equanimity as appropriate that means actively strive what is actively striving is that they abandon the unharmful the harmful states of mind when they arise and they try to develop equanimity how can you develop equanimity one of the ways is by doing vipassana meditation right just seeing things as they are that are arising and falling right through active striving they become dispassionate towards the specific source of suffering so that the suffering is worn away buddha here gives the example of a man who is in love of a woman and who is full of intense desire towards that woman now that man sees the woman uh, 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 engaging in some discussions with some other man spy uh, 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 chatting giggling and laughing so how would that man feel the first man feel he will feel bad because why he will feel bad because of that intense lust and desire that he has towards the woman so what he'll do he'll, he'll do intense striving he'll remove the quality of lust that is in him and he will develop an equanimity right towards all women so what happens is through that his suffering goes so this is the right kind of striving that buddha said not the striving that jain said like standing on one leg or fasting for days and days buddha said that is the wrong striving this is the right striving okay uh fine then mendicant reflects buddha is saying mendicant reflects when i live as i please that means i just keep my mind i just leave my mind as it is uh, unskillful qualities grow and skill, skillful qualities decline but when i strive painfully unskillful qualities decline skillful qualities grow why don't i strive painfully so this is like why do i not make the right effort because if my unskillful qualities grow ultimately what happens i will get suffering then uh, buddha says after some time they no longer strive painfully that means after they develop the good qualities enough and they clear out the uh, unskillful qualities then they do not keep striving why because they have accomplished the goal for which they strive for example buddha is giving the example of an arrow smith an arrow smith was heating an arrow shaft between two fire brands making it straight and fit for use after it's been made straight and fit for use they no longer heat it heat it to make it straight and fit to use why is that because they have accomplished the goal for which they heated it it means the striving that we have to do is only till we are able to free ourselves from the defilements right after that striving doesn't have any meaning that means once a person is an arhant fully realized one then he doesn't need to strive anything because the defilements have already gone from him right so that is one more difference okay then buddha says uh, about some other qualities as to you know what a householder should do so buddha says when a realized one arises in the world the householder hears the teaching hears the dhamma goes devotes himself to the dhamma and do, goes to homelessness 
Now Buddha is here speaking about going from a lay life to a, a homeless life, a monk life. But understand here, Buddha never kind of said everyone should do that. They, Buddha also gave guidelines on the lay life, people who are living in the lay life. Yes, he definitely said in the earlier discourses, in middle discourses, that lay life is a bit difficult to practice the Dhamma. But he said in lay life also you can practice the Dhamma. It's not that only in the, uh, 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 the mendicant life as a monk, monk life you can practice. So then there is this thing that comes that they take up the training, they give up killing living creatures, they give up unchastity, they give up lying, they give up false speech, right? There's a lot of big paras, they give up talking nonsense. It's like basically they start following the eightfold path, noble eightfold path, and they are content with the robes, then they are mindful with their senses, right? All these things happen. Then they act with situational awareness. This is middle discourses 10. Satipatthana Sutta, they follow the Satipatthana Sutta and they are mindful at all times. Then they meditate, then they start meditating. And here Buddha is talking about the four jhanas. First, second, third, fourth absorption they get. And when they get the fourth absorption, they recollect, they extend the, uh, uh, the, 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 the their themselves to the getting the three knowledges, which is the first knowledge, recollection of the uh, past lives. Then the second knowledge is that understanding how sentient beings get born as per their deeds. And third is the knowledge of the ending of defilements and the four noble truths. This is suffering. This is the um, cause of suffering. This is the ending of suffering. This is the way to end the suffering. They get the, these four knowledges. Then they become fully liberated. And they realize that rebirth has ended. Spiritual journey has been completed. What had to be done has been done. And there is no return to any state of existence. So this is what the you know proper kind of a way that Buddha is suggesting for the right striving. Right? So that is what... No, Buddha has given in this discourse. So towards the end, uh, Buddha says, if sentient beings experience pleasure and pain because of past deeds, clearly, okay, so this is, I think, not that relevant. This is okay. So this is basically kind of, I will say this discourse is striving in a wrong way versus striving in the right way. So please reflect on this as per your practice, whatever practices you do, whether you are striving in the wrong way or you are striving in the right way, do think over it. Do share your insights and insights in the comment section. Thank you so much for watching this video. Namo Buddhaya.